We saved the best for last, I think. Um, this is going to be a great panel that talks about all the interesting information that you can learn about using your digital avatar. God forbid that you yourself are you know, in some other movie right now that you don't even know about. But we're going to learn about it now. Um, to, we have a two really great experts here to talk about it. We have Sarah Howes, who is with SAG-AFTRA, who's going to be talking about that perspective. And we have Ian Sloten from NBC Universal, and he's going to be talking about the movie studio side of this. And I want to start with Ian, who's going to kind of set the stage for us today. Great. Uh, thanks, Katie. Um, and, and so what we're going to talk about today is, as Katie mentioned, is not uh, uh, content in general, but professionally produced film and television content. Um, and what I'm going to go through is some copyright considerations. I'll go through that very quickly because it's a lot of, is repeating what's already been said today. And then move into sort of the right publicity issues, which uh, folks talk about a lot. Um, so in thinking through copyright issues on this, uh, I thought I would take an example of something that's not professionally produced and not something you would think of as, as a, a popular film or television show. But it's just kind of an interesting use uh, on the internet of, um, of deep... We are, we're somehow, Doesn't seem that's weird. not it. <laughs> we're not is digital it? avatar. Oh. oh, wrong one. Maybe one wrong. Okay, that sounds like there, there we go. Reporter, so. Okay, there it is. <laughs> so this is a meme that's on the internet where uh, users are using, um, oh, and now it's gone. There it is. Oh. Oops. <laughs> oh, no. There it is. Okay, so anyways. No. Oh. And well, I'll, I'll just say what it is. Um, uh, essentially, it is uh, users taking Nicolas Cage's face and putting him into various films where he didn't actually appear, Lord of the Rings, uh, Superman, uh, Titanic, and other things like that. Um, and so if you want to think about copyright issues related to that, um, let's see if it moves to the next slide. There it is. There we um, go. One, one before, I think. There we go. So thinking about the copyright considerations here, I grouped them, grouped them into two categories, sort of what I'm calling standard clearance issues, which is essentially the same issues that apply for content that doesn't include an avatar. Like, it, you know, what elements are eligible for copyright? What parts are new? What parts are not? And, sec and, and secondly, what other elements are appearing in the footage, uh, and do those need to be cleared? Um, and then the novel issues are the authorship issue that's been discussed a lot uh, today. Um, and secondly, the use of training data to create uh, the, the Nicolas Cage uh, avatar. So speaking quickly about the standard clearance issues, um, there, you know, I'll very quickly, because this is obvious to everyone in the room, um, uh, the question of eligibility, you know, what, you know, the likeness itself is obviously not something that can be copyrighted, neither can contextual footage if, uh, it, you know, if it's from somewhere else. Um, but um, perhaps the avatar's performance poses movements and dialogue. Uh, the, maybe if there's a new plot, you know, those, those could be eligible for copyright. Uh, one note is that, uh, you know, in the example of Nicolas Cage, you know, that's, a, that's pretty much a derivative work, so that's not, you know, going to work. Um, Moving to the novel considerations on authorship, um, I think for while it is true, of course, that um, that that not that works created purely by machines, um, you know, are not eligible for copyright in the United States. Um, I don't think we have to worry too much about that for professionally produced film and television content because we're a long way off from a situation where uh, a studio like mine will put out a film or a television show that's entirely created by by a machine. It's just there's just too much. Too many variables. We're, we're just, as I think has been shown here, that there's just too many moving parts there right now. So the question is more around, you know, what we're worried about are disputes that may arise as to who the author is, who the human is, who did did the lion's share of the creativity. Um, uh, it could be the designer of the AI algorithm, as been discussed earlier today, who the person who selected the training data. Um, uh, or the you know the operator, the one who iterates on on the results, um, and and from our perspective as a movie studio, you know our primarily primarily concern is to make sure that there's some clarity around that, so that we know you know as a producer you know whose rights you know who who we need to clear the rights from, you know who we need to obtain those rights from. Um, moving next to the training data issue. Um, 
the, you know, in a situation where, uh, like in, in the Nicolas Cage example, it, pr presumably a lot of footage of Nicolas Cage from various points would need to have been used to train the AI system to do what, what was just done. And so the question would be, you know, using pre-existing footage like that, you know, is it a fair use or not? Um, and I, without judging that particular example, I, you know, the, our, our main points on this uh, is that um, is that we don't need a special new fair use rule in the United States to deal with this, this question. Um, the existing fair use factors are supposed to be technology neutral when they were enacted, and, and indeed, um, when courts have applied them to mass digitization uh, applications, um, they have come up with nuanced uh, results. Um, so for example, in the Google Books case, that was determined to be a fair use. Uh, whereas in the TVI's case, which was uh, a similar situation except that the, the application was different, you know, that was determined not to be a fair use. So moving now to rights of publicity. Um, just as a quick reminder, uh, the rights of publicity are state rights. They're not uh, federal. Um, and it has to do with using a name likeness or identity for a commercial purpose. Um, there's a mix as to which states uh, recognize postmortem rights. It's not uh, across the board. And finally, um, when we're talking about film and television and expressive works, you know, there, there, they, there needs to be a First Amendment accommodation there because, of, because they are expressive works. So what are the key tests uh, that have come up in, in sort of accommodating the First Amendment? Uh, one is strict scrutiny, right, which will say that all, nearly all uses are exempt because um, uh, a right of publicity statute is a content-based regulation of speech, and so under the Supreme Court's rubric that requires a uh, a compelling government interest uh, and a narrowly tailored uh, solution to, to that interest. Um, and m in many respects, you know, simply, you know, wanting to have a say over what is said about you uh, in, a, in an expressive work that is not defamatory, you know, probably generally would not rise to the level of being, you know, being a compelling interest. Um, transformative use, um, uh, this is a test that was developed in California, uh, essentially saying how, how, what was the transformative nature of the work and the use. Uh, and finally, the Supreme Court had one case that, about Zucchini that I'll mention a little bit later. Um, so strict scrutiny, um, this, was a case, uh, this, this was a case involving the Hurt Locker. Um, the, the, uh, the, 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 the Hurt Locker is about, uh, main character is a bomb disposal technician in Iraq. Uh, it was based on an interview um, that was given um, uh, to, a, to a reporter uh, by, uh, by Jeffrey Sarver, and Sarver sued saying, you based the movie on me, that's not okay. Um, the Ninth Circuit held that, you know, applied strict scrutiny, applied the Supreme Court case, uh, Reed v. Town of Gilbert, which had come out the year before, to say that, um, uh, essentially, the California right publicity statute is content-based and it's subject to strict scrutiny. And by the way, uh, th for that reason, Sarver lost his case. And by the way, one of the points that they made was that Sarver wasn't even in the business of monetizing his persona. So there wasn't even a loss of income or anything like that in that situation. Transformative use, uh, just very quickly, um, you know, established in two uh, key cases in the California Supreme Court, one relating to lithographs of the Three Stooges, the other relating to a very fanciful comic book. Um, and, and, and essentially, um, you know, what, one thing to note about the transformative use test is it still needs to sit within the rubric of the First Amendment. So it, it may very well be that you know a test that can be applied and makes sense in certain cases, but it's but it must that must be because it's consistent with the First Amendment. Uh, one way of thinking about that is the transformative use test might actually be um, uh, a way of distinguishing between um, expressive uses and merchandising uses, right? So the the example of the lithograph. Uh, you know, it w was a picture, but it was on, I mean, it was on t-shirts and other things. So the question is, you know, we were at, we were sort of at a line between merchandising and, and expressive, um, and since merchandising has a lower level of scrutiny, uh, commercial speech does, um, you know, perhaps, you know, that, that this is a way of differentiating those things. And finally, there's the uh, only Supreme Court case about uh, right of publicity, um, and it's a human cannibal case. Um, and essentially what happened is the local news um, showed a 10 minutes, 10 second story, which was essentially the, the entire act, right? It, was, it showed him shooting out of the cannon, 
Um, and Zucchini said, hold on a second, no one's going to go to the fair and see me you know, perform my human cannibal act because they've already seen it on the news. And the Supreme Court said, uh, yep, you know, you got a good point there. Um, rebroadcasting the entire act, this is uh, a substantial threat to the economic value of the performance. Um, so a couple of caveats about this case. It's a very old case. It predates uh, more recent Supreme Court pronouncements on strict scrutiny. And strict scrutiny did, wasn't applied in this case. Um, an another point, um, you know, one, one of the... One, one of the key interpretations of this case, possible interpretations of this case, is that while, you know, is that taking a person's performance that they have worked to establish that, you know, their livelihood, you know, it, you know there can be a right of publicity uh, claim for that. So now moving to, you know, avatars and depictions of performers. This, this leads to sort of a distinction between depictions of performers as themselves and, and depictions of performers performing a role. So in the first example of, of showing up as themselves, I gave a couple of examples uh, you know, where avatars weren't used, but actors were used, right? So the top one is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, the actor Mike Moe uh, you know, played the Bruce Lee as himself. You know, Bruce Lee shows up at, on the film set and fights with Brad Pitt. Um, and then the, then the second one is the FX series Feud, Betty and Joan, uh, in which uh, Susan Sarandon and Jessica Lange, uh, you know, played Betty Davis and uh, Joan Crawford in, in, a, in a series about, you know, power dynamics in Hollywood and how women were treated in Hollywood. So, uh, it, it, at least from our perspective, it seems that these portrayals are all perfectly okay. And that I think most would, people would agree that, you know, that, that the subjects of these, uh, of these works should not have the right to approve or not approve their depiction in these, in these sorts of works that are not defamatory. Um, and our, and, and the, 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 the corollary to that is, should, does the technology make a difference? So, it, so Mike Moe looks a lot like Bruce Lee. You know, he worked really, really hard to have the same mannerisms, the same voice, everything else. Um, and, and in fact, you know, if you look at some other portrayals, you know, people remark about how about how well an actor, you know, uh, inhabited a role. Uh, you know, what's the difference between that and using a you know an avatar of of, of the person? Um, from a First Amendment perspective, it seems like there probably isn't a difference, um, and that should probably be a guiding principle in terms of thinking through you know the permissibility of these things. Um, the second category, right, is is performing a role, right? So this is a scenario where essentially you say. Universal says, we're going to make Jurassic World the next movie. We don't want to hire Chris Pratt to play the lead role, so we're going to use the starring the avatar of Chris Pratt, and we're not going to get his permission to do that. Um, that seems to fall under this Zucchini precedent, potentially, saying well, you'd be essentially taking away this actor's livelihood. Um, you know, so, so that is something you know, to be considered. Um, our, the examples in here are actually both of deceased celebrities. Uh, the first one is Paul Walker from Fast and Furious when he passed away during filming. The second one is uh, Carrie Fisher uh, in the recent Star Wars film. Um, our, our view would be that there's a difference between living and deceased uh, individuals in the sense that you know once you're deceased, you no longer have the ability to earn a living. Um, you know that is no longer taken. Um, and under a strict scrutiny analysis, uh, you know, the, the, an interest of an heir to protect the reputation of their, uh, of, of, of their, um, uh, of the person uh, when actually defamation doesn't even apply after a person has passed away, you know, is, or the right to collect some money for it, you know, is not sufficient um, for that. So a, a couple of other points on this. Um, if there's going to be a, uh, a consent required to use a, an, a, an avatar to perform a role, uh, that doesn't sound like a right of publicity right, because right of publicity it relates to uses in commercial speech, um, and these are not commercial speech. Um, so, it, so if there's going to be a right like this, it's probably a sui generis right. Um, the second point. Um, is that it needs that, that any right like this needs to be appropriately tailored to exempt the kinds of uh, performances that we think are okay when we use living actors. So, for example, a biopic of an actor um, 
is probably going to have scenes in which that actor is performing a role as part of the biopic of the actor. Clearly, that's okay too. So, so the, the just it's a very nuanced uh, uh, area. Um, and then the third point is that it probably makes sense to consider uh, the concept of deception and fraud and passing off in this context because thinking through the difference between having uh, hiring an actor to look exactly like uh, someone and using an avatar, the difference may be that, that, that the second case is so realistic that people could actually think that someone performed when they didn't, that someone said something when they actually didn't say it, those sorts of things. And, and if, if someone is taking active steps to profit from that, to deceive the public into thinking that uh, someone uh, you know, endorsed something when they actually did not or were not involved in a project when they were not, you know, th that may be a framework to think through uh, some of these issues. Uh, and finally, um, just uh, a note, uh, you know, that distinction I mentioned about uh, performers uh, as themselves versus performing a role, it doesn't really work for other kinds of public figures. So, um, you know, musicians, athletes, political figures, um, you know, it can't be the case that, you know, musicians are known for, for singing or paying, playing instruments, but in a biopic of Freddie Mercury, you can clearly show Freddie Mercury performing music. Um, in, in uh, you know, or showing Jackie Robinson, you know, playing baseball, or showing Dick Cheney, you know, doing his usual Dick Cheney stuff. Um, so that, that's, pretty much, that's pretty much everything I have. Thank you, Ian. And now we're going to turn to Sarah, who has maybe a little bit of a different perspective <laughs> on the issue from SAG-AFTRA. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say that like um, it's important to note that you know Ian and I have uh, more in common uh, than we disagree. I, I do respect um, his work on the First Amendment to a large degree. We do have some significant differences um, that always uh, get nice headlines. Um, but uh, anyway, so I'm going to start off, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this from a production standpoint, to be completely honest, just because um, part of this is uh, a lot of you are lawyers, and part of this is an opportunity to um, think about this from a perspective of sort of guidance on what the union kind of expects. I'll spend a little bit of time um, kind of, you know, responding to some of the things Ian said about the law and things like First Amendment, but I really do want to focus on, you know, what is the technology, what are the advancements in the technology, you know, what are the union rules, a little bit about how we see the laws, and then I'm going to go into a pretty serious topic, which is how I spend about a third of my time now, which is, you know, Me Too related issues in the industry. Okay, great. So um, this is talking about just generally some of the concerns we have about the uses of digital images and sort of how it runs into some of the things that um, Ian was talking about. We have just the traditional, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the sports cases of using an athlete in a video game. Um, I'll talk a little bit about using a musician in a video game. Um, we have the realistic what he was talking about in terms of, you know, bringing an actor to play a role with digital technologies, and you're talking about that in films, you're talking about that in TV shows, video games, um, to give a realistic acting performance. Um, the next one is holographic live performances of musicians or actors. Um, and this is happening right now. Uh, in fact, um, unfortunately, the leading um, hologram uh, creator is also the person who um, created Film On. Um, and also, he doesn't like copyrights very much, and then also just got the largest sexual harassment judgment against him. So I'm very happy that he's the leading uh, person on holographic uh, co concert technologies. Um, the last piece is just voice cloning. That's something that has been um, interesting from the, research, the work that I've been doing for the last four years is just how um, advanced this technology is getting and all the different ways that you can use it and how that impacts um, people like voice performers. Great, so um, we're gonna talk a little bit about just, I wanna talk a little bit about sort of the old school way of doing some type of false depiction. Uh, so uh, there was a film, uh, an Inflamaniac, it was made overseas, so it wasn't under one of our contracts. Um, and the way that they were able to depict uh, Shia Bluff's character as engaging in simulated sex um, was they actually hired porn stars to come in um, and have real sex, right? And then what they did was they didn't actually use any type of CGI. 
They just actually edited it in such a creative way um, that it looked like it was him being depicted in these acts. Um, this is an important note. As I said, um, right now all of you are representing film companies, and just so you know, um, it doesn't matter if someone's a porn star or not. There is no actual sex <laughs> in any um, union-covered work. Um, a body double is a principal performer, and um, it is obviously for lots of reasons very, very risky to have any performer performing actual sex, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. Okay. Um, so then the next kind of, you know, more advanced form of doubling um, is where you want to actually see the person's face onto the body. Um, and so Natalie Portman, this is a little bit scandalous because they didn't disclose that it was a body double at first and then it came out after she won an Oscar. Um, <laughs> but they hired, um, so they hired a dancer to be the body double in this film um, and she performed the scenes and then Natalie Portman performed the scenes and of course course, the professional dancer did a little bit of a better job. <laughs> so what they did was they put this, you know, mask on her, and then they used CGI um, and, you know, some basic um, advanced tracking technologies. And this can be done with the software um, After Effects, which is a pretty affordable consumer product. Um, and then they just did CGI blending um, and adjustments. Uh, Peter Cushing, this is where it gets a little bit interesting um, because this is um, really one of the biggest examples of what I call just like digital human uh, technology where you were able to create, even though you could, you know, if you looked close enough, you could tell that it was digitally done. But I know people that literally were like, wow, he looks great for his age, right? They went to the film, um, they were duped. Um, and this process was really using a lot of different um, types of advanced uh, motion picture sciences and special effects. It was starting with, as you guys have seen for the last decade, right, performance capture. Um, Guy Henry, who was a very well-respected British actor, um, decided to take on this role, which is good for him. Hopefully he got paid a lot because he wasn't really depicted as it. <laughs> um, and he came in and they were able to do um, the, uh, uh, basical mapping and sort of CGI with his face. They were able to capture all of his movements. Um, and then the way that they made it look like Peter Cushing is that they couldn't just use it from images and old footage of Peter Cushing. Um, they were sort of lacking the ability to really get his bone structure and his actual face mapping. So they were able to track down, because Peter Cushing was known for being in a bunch of like British horror movies. Um, and so they were able to track down this old face mold that they had. Um, and so they were taking, you know, because when you're taking somebody from an older era before the digital era, you don't have things like, which I'm about to show you, like onset scanning, right? So nowadays, um, particularly if you're doing any type of large budget or action adventure movie, part of a condition of your employment from being a background performer to being the leading star is to do various types of 3D, 360 degree scanning so that people have data basically of your entire body. Um, there are a number of my members who do not like this. <laughs> they find it very intrusive. Um, the uh, public people who have talked to the press and to me about it are, um, Donald Glover was very upset about this. He did not like engaging in this. He, um, he has some concerns about the cultural misappropriation, potential abuses of his body being scanned. And then also um, Jessica Chastain did not like being scanned in this way. They found it intrusive. Um, but this is becoming a commonplace. Um, it's a condition of employment, including background actors. Okay. Um, so then this is where we get to artificial intelligence, right? So all of those processes that I was talking to you about uh, are, were very expensive and they were very time consuming. The Peter Cushing example took 18 months and millions of dollars, right? And then in January 2017, an article dropped about artificial um, intelligence deepfakes. So I'm going to show two examples, but I'm not going to show the whole thing, just enough for you guys to see it. So the first one um, is a fantastic professional impersonator, um, and then the ability to sort of take his impersonations, um, yep, that's right, and then I use deep fakes to have him depicted as the person. Writing's not that easy, but Grammarly can help. This sentence is grammatically correct. Okay. I'm Jim Eskimen, and I wrote a poem about what it feels like to be an impressionist. Is anything more sad and lame, contemptible, beneath disdain? In short, 
provoking of disgust than being an impressionist. A third rate, even fourth rate skill. The definition of cheap thrill. Like watching farm equipment rust is watching an impressionist. Relic from a distant day that long <laughs> since should have died away. Dishonorably mentioned is the pitiful impressionist. Okay, so Weird. for uh, purposes and of time, we'll move on to the next one. Ostentatious. Um, it's a great video, though. You can watch it. Um, so then the next one is um, was really scary, to be honest, for actors when they saw this. So this is putting Harrison Ford into the solo movie. Well, he'll never part with it. He loves that ship. He won it. Playing Sabak. And there's the rub, right? How was I supposed to know she was an Imperial spy? I thought she loved me. <laughs> That's the guy, huh? <laughs> An interesting style. I'll say. You say one is ship. I have an awful spot this. I'm gonna call I can it. take it. Let me out. Thank you. Thank you. You see, how'd you guys let me beat you on that one? Come on. There's no liars in this game. Just players. The seat taken. All right, so we can um, have that example. Oh, it's almost done anyway. It's okay, but we'll stop it. Nobody's in the seat. It. Can any take it? Um, so when that video came out, um, let's just say I got a lot of responses from the members, and um, even directors started seeing it. And you know, because to be honest, that was pretty much production ready, right? That's what was sort of scary about it. Um, and so, oh, let's see here the next slide. Okay, so then this is the part where I wanted to talk a little bit about voice cloning, um, because I actually think voice cloning um, has. Uh, a lot more potential harms, and I honestly think it's going to impact your average middle class performer a lot more. Because if someone's going to take an image, right, there has to be a pretty valuable um, amount of money to that image for it to be worth taking. Um, voices, um, how many people in here, you know, can uh, name the actor who played Little Mermaid? Or the actor that you hear at Walmart, right? Those people make their living as voice performers, um, podcasters, um, video game performers, and they're not the people you see on the red carpet. So Adobe Voco, um, this is one form of technology. So what's interesting about the voice cloning and the new voice technologies is actually, you know, synthesizing and re-editing, that's been around for a long time. What they're saying is new is the ability to insert a new word. So have somebody say a word that they've never said, and you think it's that person saying it. So there's different ways to go about doing this. So Adobe Voco, basically what it does is it takes a recording of someone's voice, and it breaks it out into these tiny little bits of 80 different types of sounds that are common in the English language, and it quickly re um, arranges them to have you say a word. So Jordan Peele did a great presentation of this where he came in and he said something like, I love to kiss my wife when I come in the door, and then they changed it to, I love to kiss my dog when I come in the door, right? So they were able to insert the word dog. So then the second one with the link, this is a company that kind of started, um, which I'll have you click on, um, a couple years ago. They're using artificial intelligence to to do voice cloning. So I'll have you go to the bottom, and I'm just going to explain a little bit about how this is done. So I did this, and I am not a professional actor, and it sounded a little bit robotic, right? Um, and then we got you know, people like Richard Mazur and Harry Shear, people who are top voice actors, to do it, and it sounded like it was them. So what they do is it's literally a minute of capture where they say a bunch of random phrases, and then within a minute, you have a voice clone. And then you can just literally type in sentences. So there's an example, if you click on the um, little blue on the left, that's a person's real voice. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, go to the um, Mozilla Firefox at the bottom, like the other app. I have it uploaded on there. There we go. Doesn't work on. In another moment, down went Alice after it. Never once did she consider how in the world she was to get out again. So then go to the next one. My voice might be generated by a computer, but I think it sounds pretty human. I don't know exactly how they made it, but I'm really impressed. So that was done with one minute of audio. 
Um, yeah. Okay, so then I'll go, go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, oops. So there are union rules around some of this stuff. So I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about, because um, especially since a lot of people here have been talking about what your source material is, what your underlying licensing material is, is that if you're a production and you license out or you yourself use any type of existing footage that was made under our contracts, you actually have to go back and the new time of use that's important that you're going to use this footage again, you have to get permission. And if you don't get permission, there's going to be contractual damages from the performer. Um, it's really important to say that it's the time of use, so you can't just have a contract that waives all reuse for the future. You literally have to come back and say, oh, I want to use this scene from um, the latest Disney movie. I want to use it in the next sequel. You have to get reuse permission. Um, and then there's another aspect to this that has to do with copyright enforcement. So for instance, if somebody uses your clip and they didn't get permission, the producer has to show us, they usually write me a letter, that says, you know, here's the fair use reasons that the other side is going to have. This is really important under like the lens decision where you have to sort of show that you thought about, um, you know, fair use before you start enforcing things. Um, and then if they don't have a good fair use uh, argument for the, the person who did it without authorization, that the producer has to enforce their rights as a copyright owner. Um, in this last year, in 2019, we actually entered into our first ever Netflix agreement. So not only are they bound by our larger theat TV theatrical agreement, they also came to the table and we negotiated a special agreement. And inside of that, um, people don't really know this, but background actors are covered by SAG-AFTRA, but they're only covered um, a certain amount. And they have to, like, let's say you're in LA, you have to have, I think it's like 35 background performers who are covered union performers. And the rule basically says that you can't use like digital doubling of background actors, which is pretty common in like fight scenes and stuff like that, um, as part of that count. Oh, there's, um, sorry, there's one more rule that is actually just the rights of the depicted person, which is, as you can imagine, where I see this voice cloning really being used in the future is going to be dubbing. All over the world, movies are dubbed for those markets. As you can imagine, there's going to be a huge market incentive for, like, let's say, you know, what's the last movie you think, one of the last movies you made? Yeah, yep, yep. Uh, 1917. 1917, right? So it's in English, I would imagine, yes. So you probably want to have it be in Chinese or whatever it is. And this technology is going to allow you to have, what's one of the actors in 1917? That I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, I should have known that. Okay, um, so you want to have him with his voice and his resonance and his kind of performance. Uh, have him doing it in Chinese or Japanese because obviously foreign markets, I believe, are important to you, right? Yes. Okay, um, and so on, you know this is going to be a really kind of harmful to the dubbing community, right? Because they make a lot of money doing this. But then on top of that, what happened in our contract? If somebody, say that you're um, Antonio Banderas and you speak Spanish, um, you have a first right to do the dubbing yourself, and that's in the contract. So the reason that you know, you're thinking, oh, well, there are some union rules, you know, so can't you handle all of these digital replica issues through union contracts? Um, it's really important to talk about sort of why that's a problematic way of thinking about it. Sometimes people are like, well, can't this just be handled by union contracts? So the way that, and I'll try to be quick here, I apologize. Um, the way that this works um, is that we are the exclusive bargaining partner for actors performing in audiovisual works. That does not mean that every audiovisual work is union covered, um, right? The reason that we're able to hook NBC and all these other companies to doing union projects and coming to the table is I imagine you want to hire our stars and our members, right? Um, so in order to hire, they are bound, the stars and the actors are all bound to Global Rule 1, which means they cannot do any type of covered jurisdiction um, or they're violating their, um, their role as a member. And then on top of that, like I said, we are the exclusive bargaining agent for performing and labor. We're a labor union, right? So if someone's doing licensing of athletes and video games, that's an image licensing deal, right? That's not a labor issue. Um, and so that's the reason that it's really important to have external rules. 
Okay, great. So right of publicity, he already went into that and I'm running out of time. Um, I did want to make a couple of notes just to respond to a couple of differences that we have. Um, you know, uh, my, you know, the way that I read the server decision about California is that I 100% agree that biopics should be exempted in statute, and I 100% believe that if you were doing a biopic and having somebody depicted in their real life, that that should be bound by strict scrutiny. I read the server decision, and I'm not, we're not going to go back and forth on this. I just encourage you all to read it, which would be a great thing. Um, I read it as that California law still has the transformative test for that's for right of publicity general, and in the case itself, it actually goes through this long laundry list of like, we're not talking about greeting cards or advertisements or merchandise or performance theft is one of the examples that they use that are in the traditional right of publicity framework. And then it says we're talking about a biopic and right of publicity doesn't apply to biopics. And if it did apply to biopics, it would have to survive the strict scrutiny, which I think is a very big dis distinction. Um, yes. But there are states that have strict scrutiny as the standard, um, notably Florida and um, I, Nevada. Okay, so Gwen Stefani, this was a case out of the California uh, Court of Appeals. Um, let's see, whoops. Oh, okay. Um, and so this is a case that talked about basically like inside of the right of publicity while um, citing Zucchini uh, said that basically a person performance theft, if you are um, taking someone a literal recreation of somebody doing the activity for which they're known, um, that that is a right of, a right of publicity violation unless you have some sort of, um, you've transformed it under the transformative test to the point that it's not just like stealing the economic value of that digital re, um, uh, recreation. Uh, let's see here. So this is an example of something that was disputed, but it never resulted in a lawsuit, and they ended up just changing it. Um, but an example of how this can happen. So Ellen Page is one of our members, and she was doing a video game and promoting it where she did performance capture and all this different work. It was a covered contract um, for the video game called Beyond Two Souls. Um, and right before Beyond Two Souls was supposed to release, um, The Last of Us came out, and a whole bunch of people were like, wow, Ellen Page is in The Last of Us. Um, she was not. <laughs> so uh, the actor that was hired is Ashley Johnson, who I depict on the left. As you can tell, they look nothing of like, um, as is being depicted in that little bucket that says The Last of Us original. Um, so Ellen Page on a Reddit thread, someone said, oh man, isn't it an honor to be depicted in this video game? Um, and she did not think that was an honor. Um, she thought she was being ripped off and she didn't appreciate it because she had her other game coming out and she, that was a lot of money um, to have two, she was basically competing with the digital version of herself. Um, settlements were made or whatever, all of a sudden it was adjusted a little bit, but if you go on the video game review uh, YouTube channels or whatever of people playing video games, the joke is that it's um, Juno. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about a more, um, a very serious issue that's come up and I, um, so this is, everyone's probably heard of deep fake pornography. We were just talking about it in the space of creating like, you know, Nicolas Cage memes and sort of putting, you know, people into Han Solo movies. Um, this is much more serious, right? This is not a laughing matter. Um, this is a form of image-based sexual abuse. Um, it is, some, there's been multiple studies being done. Um, it's actually almost impossible to find one of these deep fake porn videos, which is using still images to put people into very graphic pornography as performing those pornographic works. Um, has. 99% of this has been of women. So it's very gendered. Um, and you know, from our members' perspective, this is both a form of basically revenge porn um, and sexual abuse. It's very traumatizing. They are not happy about it. There are entire websites dedicated to fake porn that have a thousand profiles of our members, of different members. Um, it's being monetized on the internet. So my members view it as both a form of sexual abuse and a gigantic um, form of commercial exploitation. To give you an idea of how much money the porn industry makes, the worldwide revenue of porn is $96 billion a year. To put that in perspective, and the people from ESA can correct me, um, but the worldwide video game market is $81 billion a year. 
And as you could imagine, in the same way that people want to go out and see Scarlett Johansson's movies because they're a fan, people are going out to watch Scarlett Johansson porn because they're a fan. Um, and so this is massive exploitation. It is very much predicted that these sections of these websites are going to be the most popular for these companies. And these are major porn websites that are hosting deep fake porn. And if some of them are advertising it. But they're careful not to actually use the people's names or their images um, so that they don't have any liability under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, OK, finally, I'm going to end on an even you know, less uh, wonderful topic, which is the reason that SAG-AFTRA is also so committed to having laws about the digital manipulation for sexual content is because we are in the process of really deep diving into what is a systemic, horrible um, practice in the industry um, of nudity violations in this industry. So these are allegations, um, like everything in Me Too, unfortunately, as Everyone knows in this room there aren't a lot of prosecutions and there aren't a lot of instances of liability or judgments or people bringing cases because of things like blacklisting and silencing and just fear of people coming forward with their stories. So these two women came forward with their stories. These are allegations. We have, I cannot say it happened, but if it happened, it's pretty horrific. Um, Amelia Clark was on HBO's um, Game of Thrones, and she talked about how she was basically pressured her entire time to perform in the nude and to engage in sex acts. And Ruth Wilson recently came out that the reason she left the affair was because of how much pressure she got to do those scenes and how some of them would be like, oh, you're going to do like a basic sex scene, and it would turn into like basically a form of rape. So this is why you know doubling falls into this and why deep fakes is very scary to us. So just to give you an idea of how sort of doubling violations happen, it's you're sitting there and you're trying to pressure the actor to do this nude scene or the sex scene. And they just say no. So you got this one call from this woman. It was actually a pretty large production. And she was like, can you guys just like tell them to stop bugging me? I don't want to do a nude scene. And then a few months goes by, and all of a sudden, oh my god, they're using a body double. Please help me stop them, right? Um, the response is actually pretty similar to when you ask people who are making deep fake porn, hey, why did you do this? Why did you use a body double to depict this person naked? Um, and they say, well, it's not her real body. I don't get what the big deal is. These are very, very harmful. Um, if you are a performer who decides to do a nude scene or a sex scene, it's going to be harder for you to do commercials. It's going to be harder for you to get roles in kids' movies. It's going to live with you for the rest of the li your life. It's going to show up on Mr. Skins, uh, porn websites, things like that. So when it comes to deep fakes, as you could imagine, we're not very happy about this technology being able to give independent film producers. We're which is a lot of where this abuse happens, um, a really cheap tool to just exploit a bunch of performers. And so that's why we worked very, very hard. California now has a new law, 1708.86, uh, which gives um, victims of any type of either deep fake porn or manipulated content of manipulated performances um, a civil cause of action. Um, when it comes to copyright, because we're here at uh, Copyright Forum, I do want to point out that I consider this to be uh, probably the best example of a moral rights violation of a performance. If you were to manipulate it into being sexual, the right of integrity under the Berne Convention is making something that causes massive reputational harm. And I, I feel that this law uh, falls into that compliance of the US. And then that's it. Thank you, Sarah. We are running quite late. Nice. Um, no, no, it was great. It was very interesting. Um, I think that instead of me asking you questions because we are running late, I would like to give the opportunity for anyone out there to ask a question. So before we wrap up, does, oh, look, Ben. Hello, Ben. I just want to uh, add, um, like movies, video games are expressive works and fully protected by the First Amendment. If you want to know more about our views on the right of publicity and digital avatars, feel free to come to my video game law class at Georgetown next <laughs> month. Right <laughs> Anybody else? OK, well, with that, thank you guys so much. That was really educational and, and great. And thank you. And I think we are supposed, we are going to just wrap this up. So and we're not going to give any closing remarks except for to say thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to WIPO for partnering with us on this. And we will continue to work with them and keep you 
up to date about what's going on. If you don't subscribe to our news net, you should, because then you'll learn about all of these events in the future. And with that, I hope you have a great evening. Thank you for coming.